Wow, what a day that was. So I've been covering for Banjo since he's been away. The whole adventuring gig is really quite taxing, to be completely honest. Yeah, well, you would say that, Kazooie. You've been moaning non-stop all day. Are you done? No, I don't look like him actually. No, Kazooie, I don't look like him. No, I don't. Say it again and you're going to regret that. Alright then, you've asked for it. In 2019, the gaming world celebrated the return of one of gaming's most mistreated souls, and a bear was with her too. The return of Banjo and Kazooie to the limelight in 2019 is certainly something I was glad to see, especially given the love and appreciation of the characters felt seemingly universal, but it certainly didn't feel that way for a while. Banjo and Kazooie, in a way, feel like cult classics. They are tragic legends of gaming. They appeared, took the world by storm, then slowly glistened out until their recent re-emergence. Characters filled to the brim with charm, the duo largely established their status as lovable characters due to their sharp witted dialogue, memorable abilities and magnificent designs. Banjo's design staples include brown fur, a beige belly, yellow combat shorts, a shark tooth necklace and a blue backpack containing none other than Kazooie the Regal. Red and yellow feathery delight with absolutely no filter, kind of like Hulk Hogan. The characters originated from the evolution of Project Dream, a game developed by Rare of Donkey Kong Country fame, assuming you've lived under a rock and never heard of them of course. Starting as a human before becoming a bunny and eventually a bear, Banjo and Kazooie were created to infuse audiences of all ages into their platforming world, much like Crash and Spyro who we've also explored in the past. Both characters drew influence from the Donkey Kong cars considerably, of which the Rare team helped guide in a new direction design-wise. Regardless these classic designs did alter slightly along the way, but only one of them can be truly declared the best design. So on that note, I'm the artist Mark Flynn and let's find out which Banjo-Kazooie design I think truly is best. As always, please don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell as we push forward to my subscriber goal of 20,000. Only 6,500 to go. This might take a while. In Banjo's first appearance, he wasn't quite in the driver's seat pushing forward a franchise, but he was definitely in a driver's seat. The character first appeared as one of Diddy Kong's island chums in the 1997 party racing game, Diddy Kong Racing, which was a tremendous first game for the character and definitely smashed the racing competition to bits around then as far as I'm concerned. You hear that Mario Kart 64? You're overrated as hell. I'm coming for you. On this occasion, Banjo joins a long list of blocky late 90s boys that we've loved to look at in this series so far, with his 3D model looking a bit like it had been slapped with the derpy stick. It's certainly a rather crude introduction to the character, with some of the charm a wee bit lost on this iteration. His official render for the game's promotional work was much higher in quality, with the higher level of detail displaying some floof to his fur and even some freckles on his face. While I think renders like these have aged somewhat in the modern day, it provides a much easier on the eyes take on the character, with rounded edges that are far easier to enjoy. All of Banjo's costume staples and colours are here, but that backpack he wears is noticeably quiet and empty. That would soon change the long term. In 1998, Banjo would get out of the vehicles and realise his true potential as a platform gaming god, and along with Kazooie, he definitely smashed the 3D platforming competition to bits as far as I'm concerned. You hear that Mario 64? You're considerably less overrated, but I'm still coming for you. While this Banjo doesn't feel like a different character at all when compared with his original appearance, he features some improvements to his character model and even a new co-star. Quite often in this series we talk about in-game models and sprite work struggling to match up with the promotional arts of the games they represent, but this is definitely one of the occasions in my eyes where this isn't the case and the devs truly succeeded. The pre-rendered artwork is exactly the same style as Diddy Kong Racing, key difference this time being that we get to see Banjo's feet, something for my fairy audience there. However, in contrast to Diddy Kong Racing, this game model is a much more faithful rendition of the artwork, the garish blockiness is refined, and even though he is still made up of polygons, Banjo feels far more smoother and rounded. 
is less harsh on the eyes, and because of this, the character becomes more memorable and likeable. Banjo's development in this game feels like a clear improvement on Diddy Kong Racing in both a visual and audio sense. I'm Banjo! I know audio is somewhat unrelated in this series, but I can't be ignoring that. It's definitely an audio improvement, and it's unquestionably up there as a contender to be his best design. As for Kazooie, there isn't much to add that hasn't been said for Banjo already. She is established very clearly for the first time here, with her red and yellow feathers and long talons being highlighted. She also has bright green eyes in contrast to Banjo's blue ones. Rareware knew that they had done things right with these characters, or perhaps they were just a lazy bunch of British bums, because with the follow-up games in the series, there weren't really any changes to come. The sequel, Banjo-Tooie, released in 2000, shortly after Y2K had ended the world, and the characters saw no changes made to their renders or models. A few new ones would be created, such as a solo Kazooie, who is now able to leave Banjo's backpack in specific sections of the game. It's nice to see the bear loosened up on his animal cruelty somewhat. Probably best not to approach that topic actually. So we've already had our moment today where I talk about the series promo art being represented in the game via the 3D models. Seem to do that every episode actually. Well, now it's time to mention when this 3D is emulated on a handheld. Yes, much like previous characters such as Crash and Spyro again, Banjo and Kazooie also featured on the Game Boy Advance with a graphic style that attempted to emulate the main N64 games on a smaller scale. Grunty's Revenge released in 2003 and did a pretty impressive job of presenting the characters in a portable format and a job well done, but given it's just that, scaling down, it doesn't get a pass on the best design list for me. Interestingly, to begin this game, Kazooie is kidnapped and Banjo goes solo. At the time, I thought for certain this was a GBA limitation, and Banjo would be alone for the whole entry, but turns out it wasn't the case. I wonder why they were so keen to start the game off that way. A 2005 spin-off racing game would follow up this GBA title, with an interesting change taking place during its development. Beginning its plans as a spiritual successor to Diddy Kong Racing, Rare were planning to develop Diddy Kong Pilot. During the game's development, Nintendo, formerly Rare's highest stock owner, didn't renew their stock, so Microsoft bought the company outright. The ownership of a number of Rare's properties went with them, and a number of others would remain with Nintendo, though planned games would come to completion with changes made to them. So when it came to Diddy Kong, he was out the door, Banjo and Kazooie came in, and the rather odd sounding Banjo Pilot released on a Nintendo console despite being a Microsoft property in technicality. I need to clarify, this racer isn't underrated and isn't all that fun. I will not be coming for it. When you look at the game itself, the inspiration from Diddy Kong Racing is especially clear when you look at Banjo's in-game sprite that is clearly attempting to replicate this model somewhat. Kazooie's sprite is seemingly based off of her 3D model too. It's like they took part of her flying animation and shoved it in a plane. While this game didn't add anything to the table design-wise, it is notable for being the last appearance of pair in a traditional sense on the series box arts. From the original game up until this point, the characters had enjoyed a similar pre-rendered style being highlighted with each main and side entry to the series. From 1997 to 2005, it was certainly a good run for the art style. Banjo and Kazooie wouldn't make an official appearance again until 2006, where a teaser for their new adventure dropped in the form of a trailer at that year's E3 Expo. Banjo and Kazooie had been updated for the first time noticeably, with obvious modernisations and new stylized features. The new looks were surrounded by mystery and a lack of gameplay, and soon after this first look was revealed, a radio silence would follow. Turns out the design was final, but the gameplay itself wasn't. Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts released in 2008, and it was a sequel, but not the one fans of the series really wanted abandoning many of the staples of the series, and most importantly, making use of vehicles in place of Kazooie's platform aiding abilities. It's a vehicle builder, physics based platformer, and fetch quest simulator. Personally, it reminds me a bit of those gummy ship sections from the Kingdom Hearts series design wise, which I hate beyond belief. Why are these in the game? They are absolute garbage. The design of Banjo-Kazooie reflect this new world and mechanic, and the use of square shapes throughout Banjo's design at least, is a very stylized way of fitting them into this Lego block inspired creation based world. As well as this, the step into HD allows them both to have some finer details in game that they didn't have before. Banjo's outfit, while the same, has a lot more texture to it. His backpack, now complete with red straps, and his shorts have a real patchwork, sewn together feel to them. However, facial features such as his freckles aren't here from the original game's artwork. Kazooie also had a bit of a do over here. Her feathers on her head are much longer, her beak is far more curved and expressionate, and most notably, she now has much longer eyelashes. I'm unsure whether this was to make the character more feminine, or whether it was to contrast her potty mouth and attitude with a more eloquent design. Characterization wise the duo couldn't be less alike, so I think it's a really cool idea to have Banjo made up of blocky hard shapes, 
and Kazooie made up of rounder and sharper ones. It's a nice subtle way of showing just how different from each other they are through their design rather than any words. Shame you can barely see both of them amongst all the vehicles and garbage blocking the screen. I actually love both the characters' designs here, their creative takes on the previously established looks, but I absolutely hate what they represented. They are both characters in a game that isn't theirs, and while the game itself isn't actually terrible, it's not a Banjo-Kazooie game, and at this point it looks like we might never get another one. I mentioned in my last video Capcom's slight ignorance with their implementation of the rebooted DMC and Dante's design. Rare and Microsoft were similar in their execution here. Poking fun at collector funds and portraying your characters as fat jokes is great for a quick laugh and a bit of fourth wall breaking. I personally did find this quite funny, but it also established a sour taste in the mouths of fans of the series as they weren't actually getting the game they wanted. This taste clung to these designs and likely has made many people see them less favourably. Again, Nuts and Bolts isn't a terrible game, much like DMC, but it isn't what the fans actually wanted. The duo would also cameo in Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing using this look in 2010, exclusive to the Xbox 360 version of the game. It would be the last game to feature this look for them, and I remember thinking it was pretty cool to see Banjo and Kazooie in a crossover game of this nature back when it was released. It felt like a really big deal. Little did I know what would come to be in the not too distant future. While it seems significant that Banjo and Kazooie appeared in this crossover, over title, this significance was completely smashed, see what I did there, by a huge announcement in 2019. <laughs> 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 Banjo and Kazooie were coming to Smash Brothers, and the internet lost its collective minds. Accompanied by Spiral Mountain as a level, the Bear and Bird landed in the fighting franchise, eggs are blazing, and smashed through foes whilst looking incredibly faithful to their original designs. Removing the block shapes and OTT eyelashes that the Xbox had introduced, and returning to models that better resembled the look of the Nintendo 64 artwork completely surreal. Other features such as Banjo's hair look better than they've ever done before and the character's textures are just that little bit more realistic than they once were, but not too realistic. Rare proudly commented on the reveal on their own blog, drawing special thanks to Paul Cunningham, one of the artists who had previously worked on Jet Set Gemini and Donkey Kong Country. While a core cool group of folks at Rare worked on this, we have to give a special shout out to our own Paul Cunningham, who has been our main point on getting everything about Banjo and Kazooie's appearance just right. Just right is exactly right. Building off the strong original artwork and model, this version restored both of them to their former glory in beautiful HD, and boy oh boy do they look good in this game. So that's all the designs I can think of today, and outside of the Xbox's iteration, Banjo and Kazooie haven't really changed much, have they? They have been to a number of different platforms and have experimented with a few different genres, but largely speaking, they have been the same looking characters expressed in ever so slightly different ways. Ultimately, I can make my decision without too much hesitation, and it's very comparable to the decision I made in my Spyro the Dragon video too. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, the most recent inclusion of the character, absolutely nails the look of Banjo and Kazooie and is easily the best design in my eyes. It takes the original characters as intended in the game's artwork and brings their original concept to the modern day in a big way. It's as if that original art has come to life but without the somewhat nasty looking shininess from those old school style renders. Both characters are full of expression and character, faithful to their origins and feel new and improved in every sense. They are easily my highlight of the Smash Brothers Fighter Pass. So that's it for me today. What did you think? Do you agree that Smash Brothers had the best design, or do you think another game did? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to check out my Discord if you're interested. We post a lot of game art and have discussions about a bunch of different topics. Big thanks as always go out to my patrons who make videos like this possible, along with a special shout out going to Top Hat Gaming Man, Proggy Froggy, and Genghis Slade. If you'd like to help me out, please head on over to my Patreon or my Ko-fi for more info. 